Hello and welcome to Factually. I'm Adam Conover. Thank you so much for joining me once again as I talk to an incredible expert about all the amazing shit they know that I don't know and that you probably don't know. Both of our minds are going to get blown together and we're going to have a fantastic time doing it. Now, if you're watching this episode on YouTube, you will already know that this is a very special episode because it has our very first video episode of Factually. That's right. Today's interview was filmed in the studio in stunning HD and I cannot wait for you to see it. And the reason we took that step is that this week's episode is extremely timely and topical. We're talking about what is going on in Iran. To put it mildly, Iran has been in the news a little bit lately because of 10 days of massive protests that have spread across almost the entire country against the oppressive theocracy that rules that nation. The protests kicked off after Masa Amini, a young Kurdish woman, was arrested by the morality police. That's a real thing they have over there for not wearing her hijab correctly. After three days in custody, she was dead. Now, the authorities say she had a heart attack, but her family and thousands upon thousands of protesters say different. Women have been burning their head coverings in protest. Others have publicly cut their hair and demonstrations have spread across the entire country. There are even calls to overthrow the theocracy. This groundswell of protest shows that the people of Iran are much more than the theocratic boogeymen that rule them and that are often represented in the American news. And these protests didn't come from nowhere. They're the product of a long history of popular democratic uprising in the country. A history that's intertwined with shitty American foreign policy that made things worse, but that is also inspired by democratic ideals and by at least one idealistic American activist whose story has almost never been told here. So what the hell is actually going on in Iran today? What does the American media leave out? And how did we get to this point? Well, to help us answer these questions, we have the best possible guest. He's the amazing writer and scholar Reza Aslan. His most recent book is called An American Martyr in Persia, The Epic Life and Tragic Death of Howard Baskerville. I'm so excited for you to see this interview. Please welcome Reza Aslan. Yeah, Reza, thank you so much for being here. This is really exciting, man. Thank you so much for having Th me. This is our first in-studio interview in our new studio here at Starburns Audio at post-pandemic. We're here in person. Right, right. So this is probably the wrong time for me to say I have COVID then. <laughs> I, I guess, God no. it, man. God, oh, I should have said that earlier, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. well, thank you for being our first in-person guest. My pleasure. Recording some video here, too. Um, so you, you have a new book coming out about uh, Iran, about a, a, one of the earlier Iranian revolutions. That's I want right. I want to start, before we get into the fascinating story in that book, uh, I, let's just talk about Iranian political history a little bit <laughs> yeah. in relation to the United States, because we hear little bits and snippets about it. We have what we see on you know the American news. Um, but uh, whenever I sort of dip into Iranian history myself, which I, I, I only do every so often, it's a fascinating history, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, look, I Iran, like if you're talking about Iranian history, you're talking about 2,500 years of, of history here. I mean, this goes back, you know, thousands of years to, you know, one of the earliest and most successful empires uh, in the world and an empire that was responsible for some of the greatest innovations in human rights and, and religious freedoms that we all sort of take for granted nowadays. And so this is an ancient, ancient civilization. But in some ways, that's kind of the problem with Iran right now is mm. that, uh, you know, when you – have this incredible legacy, this history. Like, we used to own the fucking world. And now, you know, we're not allowed to have nuclear weapons. Like, but North Korea has <laughs> nuclear weapons and they're shit. Like, that doesn't mean, you know, there's this incredible sense of frustrated pride uh, that uh, navigates so much of what Iran does on the international stage, right? Yeah. Iranians think of themselves uh as, you know, these like this mighty civilization that just doesn't get any respect. Huh. Um, and it's it's it sounds weird to say because like it's not usually how we think about foreign policy and the way that governments make decisions. But a lot of what Iran does on the national stage is uh, promulgated by this notion that we should be taken more seriously than we actually are, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I get it. I get it. I have that same chip on my shoulder, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was like, take me seriously, goddammit! Yeah, and a lot of nations do. I mean, I feel like 
You know, when you when you think about like uh, North Korea also wants to be taken seriously, yeah. very deeply. That that seems to be a common complex for a lot of nations. But but Iran specifically, like in the United States, we see it as the exemplar of like theocratic autocracy, right? right? Where it's run by religious leaders who are very controlling of the population. But there's a there's a strange dichotomy there because also I, I know that the population is like uh, very highly educated, right? A very very cosmopolitan in a lot of ways, um, and that the the country itself has been through what three or four different systems of government over the last hundred years <laughs> yeah. and a number of those were quite liberal right yeah well as a matter of fact uh you know this is a country that over the last 20th you know over the 20th century at least has had three massive democratic revolutions the first democratic revolution in the entire middle east uh in 1906 wow. was in iran this is actually the the background for the book you were talking about um they had another revolution a democratic revolution in 1953 and even in 1979 it's funny because like we talk about the 79 revolution as the quote-unquote islamic revolution but that's just post-revolutionary propaganda this was the largest anti-imperialist revolution in the of the 20th century it brought Brought together religious groups, certainly, but intellectuals and progressives, men, women, Jews, Christians. I mean, it was uh, by some estimates, I've seen sociologists talk about this. It was the largest popular movement, you know, in terms of percentage of population uh, in the entire 20th century. It's just that, as some people, you know, may be uh, aware of, <laughs> like, Revolutions don't always turn out the way they're supposed to, you know, like right. it's all it's very easy to get everyone to agree that this guy's got to go. <laughs> but then when he goes, you know, like then who should be in charge? What? Everyone raises their <laughs> yeah. hand. Everyone's like, us, us, us. <laughs> and it just so happens that in all three of these revolutions, the revolution of 1906, the revolution in 1953 and the revolution of 1979, it was outsiders, Russian, British and Americans who – essentially interfered in the post-revolution in order to kind of get theirs and ended up, you know, fucking things up. I mean, I don't know how else to uh, yeah. how else to put it. Um, yeah. But as the U.S. that fucked things up in the 1979 revolution, is that right? Yeah. So it, in 1979, the, yeah, the, set the Shah— the stage a little bit yeah, for us. So, you know, the, the Shah, which is the king of Iran, uh, and we've had Shahs, again, going back 2,500 years— the, the Shah of Iran, who was, you know, America's greatest ally, America's best friend uh, in, in the 70s, bought all our shit, bought whatever we made, the Shah would, <laughs> the, would buy. Billions of dollars worth of military equipment, by the way, which no Iranian knew how to even use. I mean, you're talking about like advanced jets and weaponries that was just sitting on tarmacs collecting dust because yeah. the Shah thought, oh, I'll just buy all this stuff up and never actually – figured out how to use a wow. any of it. Uh, it was one of the bigger jokes of the 79 revolution is that like, you know, the revolutionaries <laughs> all like had all this advanced equipment, but no idea how to actually use it against the war in, wow. with Iraq. But in the post-revolutionary turmoil, the chaos that, that occurred, there was a lot of wrangling going on about who was who's going to run Iran. There was a provisional government there, a democratically uh, uh, elected, uh, a, a bunch of technocrats, you know, who had this provisional government in place, trying desperately to maintain relations with the world. And then two things basically fucked everything up. One was the hostage crisis, which is its own other uh -huh. crazy story that we can get into yeah, about like how that episode, happened and yeah. all that stuff. Uh, but this was the hostage crisis crisis was a two-day peaceful sit-in by a bunch of engineering students that very quickly got co-opted by Khomeini and the religious groups. Okay. It was, it was referred to as the second revolution um, and used to bring down the provisional government and to give Khomeini power. But that was just one part of it. The second part of it, which is something that Americans never talk about, is the fact that the United States with American money, American weapons, and in American intelligence, urged Saddam Hussein to invade Iran uh, right after the revolution because wow. it was the perfect plan, right? Oh, no, revolution, it may not go our way. Uh, mm -hmm. We have these, these anti-American, uh, you know, religious radicals about to take over. Why don't we get Saddam to bomb them and see what happens? And what happened was an eight-year war 
that killed millions of people on both sides. Wow. With one side being almost fully funded, supported, weaponized uh, by the United States. That's Iraq, which we th- la- later then go to war with. <laughs> yeah, of course. A decade later? A, l- a decade, decade and change? Later, yeah. 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 I mean, look, the, the, the Republican uh, Guard in Iraq during that war were – fighting Americans with weapons that we gave them to fight Iranians. <laughs> I mean, that's like the quintessential American foreign policy right there, right? This, 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 these stories when the United States does stuff, and this, this, by the way, is like, this is just one nation. You look at Latin America, you look at places all across the world, you see the U.S. meddling in terrible ways with right. other gov- toppling, democratically elected governments, things like that. These stories are all part of public record. You can go look them up on Wikipedia. They're yeah, all right there. And for some reason... They never make any impact on the American psyche about our own government. You know what I mean? There's yeah. there's always a couple people at the protest, like waving leaflets, like <laughs> yeah. look at what they did in Latin America, right? Or, or in Iran. Or like go home, hippie. Yeah, for some reason, it's never part of our national conversation about like, yeah, we did some weird shit and things went really bad. And that's why we end up in these wars over and over again after things go that badly. I think it's funny that the American and Iranian situation is complicated, I think, by the fact that they were such close allies for so many decades. Yeah, the Shah was our boy. This is like our 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 friend in this strange area Yeah, yeah. we don't understand. Here's our guy. Nowadays, we talk about how Israel is our closest ally in the Middle East, but I mean, Iran was the Israel (laughs) of the time. And so I think in, in, in a lot of ways to think about what has gone wrong in the Iranian American relationship over the last 40 years? It's like you got to think about it as like a, a married couple that got through that went through like a really bad divorce. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And like now they just the fucking guy, hate the guy, each other. Yeah, the guy like cheated on on her in front of her. Like that's how Americans think of the hostage crisis. It was so embarrassing. You know, yeah. it was such a national disgrace for the United States. 444 days in which these 52 Americans were being held hostage by what looked to us like a bunch of 20 year old crazy fanatics. You yeah. know, like what are these backwards people doing? Like we're the greatest you know, country in the world. We have the most powerful military. We have the most powerful government. We're the richest country in the world. And these fanatics have basically got us over a barrel. Um, It was incredibly embarrassing. And it created this real sense of, I think, anger and hatred in the American psyche that I know it's been 40 something years, but we still haven't gotten over. We just haven't gotten over it. And neither has Iran in many ways. Neither has Iran. Um, Well, tell tell me a little bit about – so there's this revolution. And again, you say the entire society rises up to kick out the Shah because he's seen as an imperialist, as as a – Well, he just sucked. Okay. You know, I mean he he was fattening himself and his court. uh, Mm -hmm. You know, the nation itself was – uh, poor, impoverished. Uh, there wasn't a very fair taxation system. Uh, he had this CIA and uh, uh, funded and trained secret police called the Savak, um, who, I mean, we're talking like 1984 kind of shit here. Like, I mean, literally like people who would go around uh, trying to infiltrate groups and, and you know, look for any kind of insubordination Jesus. or, or anti Shah activity. And then people would disappear and be reeducated and then show up again one day, like <laughs> fully enthralled I'm to fine. the Shah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was insane. It was really kind of dystopian stuff. And so there was this rising anger and animosity, you know, amongst the Iranian people, all the, the rich, the poor, the left, the right, the secular, the religious. I mean, it was this massive coalition that, you know, in 1979 was saying, wait, why do we even have a monarchy? What are we doing? Yeah. You know, the rest of the world is thriving because they've got constitutional representation and like, you know, a, a legislature that passes, you know, laws yeah. that we all have to follow instead of the whims of some asshole on a throne. And the the movement, it's, I mean, I was there. I was a seven-year-old kid wow. watching this thing happen. And even at seven years old, I understood that this was – profound and special and moving. Um, But, you know, as often happens, uh, America was more interested in pursuing its interests than its values. And Uh. I think in this particular case, there was a, a, a large swath of the American foreign policy establishment who thought if we 
stop supporting the Shah, then what about all the other dictators that we support? Uh-huh. Right? What about all the other autocrats yeah. that 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 we support? Like, what are they going to do? But but this is America. You would think we'd go, oh, hey, look, a revolution for uh, democ- if not democracy, uh. at least a more liberal society, right, that we could yes. maybe support. Isn't that the system of government that we think is best? And that, you know, wouldn't that be an even friendlier regime if we were able to say, oh, hey, you guys want to have a democracy. Let, 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 let us help you out with the Constitution and keep things stable mm-hmm. and stuff. That You would think that would be the American way. That is so sweet. <laughs> That's so sweet. Call me an idealist. Call me naive. It's adorable. Yeah. It's adorable. I mean, um, I'm embarrassed look, this to even propose it. You know, the entirety of American, I think, you know, history, a very short history that we've had in 250 years or so, I think is precisely this conflict between the values this, that we espouse and the interests that we pursue. Yeah. And it is extraordinarily rare that those values and those interests align yeah. in, in such a way that we actually promote political participation and democratization uh, in the rest of the world. The problem with democracy is that everyone gets a voice. And <laughs> if you need <laughs> country X to do something, yeah, you don't want them to all vote on it. Like I think back to the early days of the of the second Iraq war, you know, and I remember, you know, how quickly countries like Saudi Arabia and, and the rest of the UAE, despite the fact that, you know, they set themselves up as like the, the defenders of, of Islam and Muslims against Western, you know, infidels very quickly. were like, yeah, 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 go, go for it. Yeah. Bomb, bomb the shit out of Iraq. We're, we're all on board. And whatever you need, you need airspace, you got it. You need, uh, wow. you know, uh, 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 ports, here you go. Uh, the one country that didn't help was Turkey oh. because they voted and they voted no. And uh-huh. see, that's the problem <laughs> with democracy is that, like, yeah, in a vacuum, it sounds great. Like, oh, look at Turkey. That's so fantastic. Yeah. You know, they've got a legislature and, a, and elections and, you know, they get to vote on things. <laughs> Until the thing that they vote for matters to you. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, what if we mess around <laughs> yeah. with that democracy a yeah. little bit? Wait a minute. What if we send some CIA <laughs> agents in there to like sp- hand out some pamphlets or whatever? And this has been the history of American relations in, in Iran. I mean, look, the 79 revolution, that's a pretty obvious one. Although, again, because it sort of ended in the hostage crisis, all of America's actions, including – the 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 its role in the war between Iraq and and Iran uh, has been buried, as you say. But the most obvious one is the previous revolution in 1953. So in 1953, yeah. uh, Iranians again poor, rich, left, right, Christian, Jew, Muslim, everyone came together and kicked the Shah out. The same Shah, by the way. The same Shah, <laughs> the same. they kicked him out Muhammad, yeah. 25 yeah, years yeah, yeah, earlier. Yeah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, yeah. <laughs> uh, we kicked him out in 79, and then we kicked him out in 53. But in 53, we and then kicked he him out. Comes out. Hey, I'm back again. Hey. You're going to have to kick me out. And we and we replaced him with a democrat, democratically elected prime minister named Mohammad Mossadegh. Um, and for a few glorious months, Iran was a functional democracy. The Shah was in exile. Uh, an elected prime minister was running things. And one of the first things that that elected prime minister did was nationalize the oil. So now you got to understand the oil in Iran until at that time basically belonged to the British. I mean, it was their oil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, they paid us. They paid Iranians rent. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. we will take all your shit and then we'll pay you like a monthly rent for it. And by the way, that that rent went to the Shah. It's not like it went to the yeah. country, you yeah. know. And uh, the first thing that this prime minister did was nationalize the oil. Now, this was 53. So the UK was nothing anymore. They weren't they weren't the empire yeah. that they were anymore. They were like just basically this island kingdom now. Yeah. So they couldn't do anything about it. And so they asked America. They said, hey, uh, the British asked America, the British asked America, the British said, we don't have the the capabilities anymore of actually doing anything uh, about, you know, these these countries that don't do what we want them to do. We used to. uh, But now, you know, we can barely afford to keep the lights on uh, post World War Two. And so can you do something about it? And the United States said, yeah, sure. And we sent uh, a CIA agent by the name of Kermit Roosevelt, 
That's right. The, Kermit. Uh, wait, Kermit, I'm sorry. Ker- his name Kermit, was Kermit his Roosevelt. Name was Kermit Roosevelt. Yeah, it was Teddy, like a, Teddy like, Roosevelt's uh, Muppet I believe, brother. <laughs> Teddy, no, uh, uh, nephew. His ne- it was yes. Teddy Roosevelt's nephew. N- uh, so, someone on this show is going to fact check me. I think okay. it's either nephew or maybe great nephew. Uh, that sounds more uh, likely uh, based yeah. on the years to me. But Kermit that's Roosevelt. Wild. Kermit, guys. If you're listening to me, <laughs> Google Kermit Roosevelt. <laughs> this guy was like this 97-year-old nasally nerd with Coke bottle glasses who was the most fucking insane CIA operative, like the kind of guy who would just like point at a map and say, kill those people, uh, you know, wow. like do this, do that. I mean, this guy was such a badass. I don't understand why there isn't a movie made about Kermit Roosevelt yet. But he's but, also, he sounds like a criminal the way you're describing him. He sounds, well, he sounds CIA like a agent. horrible of course guy. He's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Kermit Roosevelt, it's called Operation Ajax. Check it out. Uh, Kermit Roosevelt, uh, and, uh, like, uh, a, a, this like professional boxer and a couple of other guys basically. And a suitcase with a hundred thousand dollars went to Iran. And w- w- this is in the very, very early days of the CIA too, by the way. Uh, so post-World War II, the CIA was try- trying to figure out like, well, what are we? Like, what do we do? Like, we're, I guess we're going to fight global communism. And so this was the first attempt by the CIA to actually, change an election outcome or, you know, government. And it was Kermit Roosevelt's idea. He pitched it to, to Dulles, to Alan Dulles, you know, and, and was like, just give me, just give me a suitcase with a hundred thousand dollars. Give me a couple of weeks and let me see what I can do. And sure enough, this guy showed up in Iran with that suitcase and like four or five, you know, agents. And within a few weeks had manufactured a fake protest uh, against Mossadegh and the government, uh, managed to bring down uh, the democratically elected government, bring the Shah back to Iran, place him back on the throne. Uh, and this did two things. Number one, now suddenly the CIA had an objective. Oh, wait a minute. Now we know what we're for. Like, we can overthrow government. Well, this is great. <laughs> like this is – that only cost $100,000. Like nobody died. I mean they, they have a protest and then uh, – what is he, it was just the Democratic regime was so fragile that it, that's It's all a very fragile or? and he, he literally handed out money and created fake – did this sort of fake protest and and there were enough Iranians you know with vested interests in sure. the Shah to to help out you so find the a, right leverage points exactly. you give a little push <laughs> yeah. and then you yeah, are you able to bring up, it down you beat up enough people you kill the right people you you stage the protests in the mm-hmm. right way they literally attacked Mossadegh's house uh, and and you know he he ran off and they they arrested him and they they put the Shah back on the throne. But this, this will make a great TV show. I'm this t- is like the dark mirror of Homeland. You know, <laughs> yeah, of like exactly. rather than trying to protect the United States, it's just trying to topple other regimes. It's, it's an insane it's an insane story about how shit used to be done. Yeah, you know, in the fifties in the CIA. And, and let's be honest, there. probably still is done. <laughs> yes, yes, come on. I think probably more than a hundred thousand dollars nowadays. <laughs> but yes, uh, the second thing that it did is that. Once America put the Shah back on it on the throne, the British were like, "Hey, thank you so much. That was great. Um, so we'll just take the oil back now." And America was like, "Yeah, no, <laughs> I, it's ours now." <laughs> and that's what happened. Fifty three yeah. is when America married itself to Iran wow. and kicked the British out. Got you it. Know? And so that's why it's so important that the Shah is our boy because Shah is our boy. we have the access to the oil. We have access to the oil. He buys all of our military equipment. He does whatever we tell him to do. We have all of our troops stationed there in case anybody else gets out of hand, you know, or anybody else causes any trouble. Um, and he's utterly dependent yeah. on us. Like he is on his throne because we said he can be. Yeah. And those are the kinds of allies that you keep forever. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like you do not lose an ally like that. But then again, there's it's a, a second. It, because it makes the country a client state. It makes you can a, do whatever exactly. you want with you your country. You can do with whatever you want. Yeah. But as you can imagine, for the normal Iranian who is pissed off at the Shah because like your dad got disappeared or because, you know, right. you can't, you don't have heat for your house or, or whatever. Or you just remember the month when you had a democracy. <laughs> and you're like, that was exactly. nice. That was really nice that month. That was a really great month. But – what you do then is that what are you going to do to the Shah? You can't do anything to the You can't be, get mad at the Shah. So who do you get mad at? 
the guy who is putting the Shah in his place, and that's the United States. And yeah. so from the early 50s, there was this real sense of animosity and anger in the Iranian populace, which was towards its own government, but – of course, it was really right. about like you know the the power behind the government and and in seventy nine that that boiled over into a revolution that again gave us about you know a couple of months of wow, this is what freedom feels like until yeah. you know the the post revolutionary chaos brought Khomeini to power and the rest is history and the, the, this is what's so bizarre when you hear Americans go like why do they hate us like what is <laughs> why, why are they why are they stomping on American flags in the street why does that happen it's yeah. like oh could it have been a hundred years of interfering <laughs> yes. in another country know. like uh, you know putting a puppet government in place and all that oh that's kind of a funny question uh, I re- look this is so enlightening we gotta take a really quick break when we come back we're gonna talk about the even earlier revolution um, this is yeah. in our capsule history of, of Iran we'll be right back with more Reza Asif. Folks, I want to tell you about Kachava, the all-in-one daily super blend. If you're worried you aren't getting the nutrients you need, well, listen up because Kachava says they have you covered. They put everything your body needs in one glass so you can have it all. All the vitamins, all the omegas, all the protein for your gut, your hair, your muscles, your heart, your whole health, they say. No more compromise, no more guilt, no other nutrition shake does all this. They travel to the ends of the earth to source it all and crush it up. Kachava is a powder. You just take two scoops, add some water, blend it up, and it tastes great. They have five delicious flavors. Chocolate and chai are my personal favorites. I have it for breakfast, keeps me full for hours. And you know what? It's tough to get these kinds of nutrients with your normal diet, especially when you're trying to manage all those supplements and all the ingredients you should be taking. It can be overwhelming and expensive. But now, Kachava says they make clean, organic, superfood nutrition accessible to everyone. So if you want to try Kachava for yourself, they're offering 10% off for a limited time. Just go to Kachava.com, that's spelled K-A-C-H-A-V-A, and get 10% off your first order. That's Kachava.com slash factually. Kachava.com slash factually. Uh, okay, Reza, let's talk about the revolution that you cover in your book, which is the even earlier revolution. Right. Do I have that right? Yeah, um, yeah. It's the first uh, of the three major democratic revolutions that Iran had in the 20th century, but it was also the first democratic revolution in the Middle East. It happened in 1906 when it's that coalition again, right? Mm-hmm. The sort of religious groups, the conservatives, the sort of pious masses, they've got the streets. And then the business interests, you know, they, they've they got, you know, access to the economy. They can shut everything down with like strikes and protests. And then the young uh, in many cases, Western-educated intellectuals who provide the ideas. This coalition, which brought down the Shah in 79, brought down the Shah in 53, mm-hmm. brought down the Shah again in 1906. They came together for the very first time. This is a different Shah this time. This is a different Shah, yeah. Okay. Different Shah, yeah. D- different uh, dynasty, in fact. Uh, uh, this is known as the Hajar dynasty as opposed to the Pahlavi dynasty. And which how long had this dynasty been in power? This dynasty had at that point been in power for maybe 150 years. Okay. Yeah, so a while. Okay. Yeah, for quite some time. Um, and what they wanted was actually pretty basic. What they wanted was a constitution. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why it's called the Persian Constitutional Revolution of 1906. And the idea of the constitution was so sort of basic and yet profound at the time. Why don't we actually put the law down on paper? Right. So that, you know, we can point to it yeah. when something happens <laughs> instead of just the law is whatever the guy sitting on the throne says the law is or, yeah. you know, whatever the guy with power says the law is. This is a very basic step in like political development. If you look at like the history of England, you've got like, a, you know, an autocratic monarch and then eventually people, no, we need a constitution. we got to write stuff down. Write Other stuff forces down. in society get power. They can write that constitution. And eventually you end up with a queen who just waves at people from a very expensive <laughs> of car and they give her a big funeral and, you know, et cetera. They're, we just got some rich people who don't have much political power, right? But, uh, so that this is like a, a very exactly. basic, yep. and, and were people in Iran looking at those other countries that had constitutional monarchies and saying, hey, this is a, this would be a civilized way to be, this is what we should do yeah. next. Right? Well, as a matter of fact, so at this point in Iranian history, the, the north of the country was more or less administered by the Russians and the south of the country was more or less administered by the British. You okay. know, it's called the, the Anglo-Russian Accord. 
Awards. And it was like this, you know, a lot of a lot of your listeners may be familiar with this term, the great game, which was sort of the game played by the Russian and British empires in the Middle East and South Asia, where they were just like divvying up uh-huh. pieces of land over who's going to run it. And, you know, they were fighting against this stuff. And there was this sort of conflict between Russia and and uh, uh, the, the UK for – Decades and decades and decades, and then in the run-up to the First World War, when they start seeing, you know, the Ottomans and the Germans start to, like, come together, and and suddenly, you know, the Sultan and the Kaiser are BFFs, then suddenly the British and the Russians realize, you know what, maybe we should stop fighting. We should start, like, you know, we should form an alliance here, and— Places like Iran or Persia, as it was called back then, let's stop fighting for it. Let's just divvy it up. You can have the north. We'll have the south, and we'll just be friends, and we'll focus on this emerging threat that's coming from you know, uh, Turkey and Germany. And so that's the world that Iran was living in when this constitutional revolution happened. And it took many years of protests and strikes and bloodshed. Uh, but finally, in December of 1906, the sort of ailing Shah at the time, this man by the name of Muzaffar ad-Din, um, signed a constitution and allowed for the creation of a parliament, wow. um, free and fair elections. Uh, and suddenly, Iran was a constitutional monarchy, wow. very much modeled on the British yeah. uh, form of it. Um, so Muzaffar signs the constitution in December of 1906 and then dies three days later, <laughs> and, which is exactly how history always works. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and, oh, thank God we got him to sign it in yeah, time. Yeah, we got to sign him. <laughs> and the guy who comes to power is his 35-year-old piece of shit son, <laughs> By the name of Muhammad Ali. Not that Muhammad Ali. Okay. A different Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Muhammad Ali Shah. And this is a kid, you know, raised in the palace. He's been told since he was, you know, born that God has made him Mm -hmm. the prince and God is going to put him on the throne and that, you know, he is is himself divine and divinely ordained to rule over Persia like kings before him have for 2,500 years, et cetera, et cetera. And he becomes Shah and immediately realizes, wait a minute, like there's a constitution now that checks my power. There's a parliament that decides my budget like that. This does not sit well with him at all. And so he puts together this plan along with the help of uh, his Russian benefactors. Russia is the real sort of villain in this story. This, I'm sorry. Yes, this sounds like the last season of Succession to me. It's, this is, this it's sounds like Succession like, meets Game of Thrones, but no dragons. This sounds like Kendall going like, what did dad do? No, what he did didn't do no, it. He, he didn't do it. He was, he was dying. His, he was, his mind was going. We can't let him do this. He gave everything away. Right. So yeah. this is what Muhammad Ali does. He... Tears up the constitution that his father uh, signed, and he rolls cannons to the parliament building while parliament is in session and destroys the building <laughs> with the parliamentarians inside. Jesus so, Christ. I don't know if Kendall would ever – I mean that's that's pretty bold. He might. He might. He might. You know, it's, a it's, a, it's a season five. We'll see. Yeah. Um, but uh, – And he declares war on the revolution. Wow. And he essentially manages to take over, take back control over every city, every town, every province in the country except one, the province of Tabriz. And Tabriz becomes sort of the last bastion of this constitutional democratic revolution. You know, this one city against the entire nation. And Tabriz happens to be the city in which at that moment in time, this 22-year-old evangelical Christian missionary from Nebraska uh, suddenly shows up to preach the gospel and teach English and finds himself (laughs) in a city uh, in the midst of a revolution fighting against this tyrannical, villainous Shah for the same democratic rights and freedoms that he enjoys in America. This is the world that he suddenly steps into. And this is the main character of your book. His name is Howard Baskerville, correct? And you describe him as the Lafayette of Iran. Did I get that right? Iranians call him the Lafayette of Iran. Do they really? Yeah, yeah. The sort of foreigner who fought 
in another country's revolution. Um, that's that's kind of how he has always been talked about. You know, <sighs> this is a kid. I mean, Howard Baskerville uh, is a fascinating kid. You know, he's sort of the the product of the uh, second great awakening in the United States. This was this was kind of great religious uh, yeah. movement that happened in America that gave birth to what we now call evangelical Christianity. It was like a movement of movements. Like doesn't uh, Mormonism come out of the second great awakening or is it the first? I'm not sure. Yeah, well, all these – what happens is it's yeah. like a moment of revivalism mm -hmm. in which uh, Christians – sort of break free from the, the the bounds of church and doctrine and they start going out and it's mostly young people this is the amazing thing it's mostly young people it's mostly white people and it's mostly women that's the that's huh. the most fascinating thing about the second yeah. it's like two thirds women led and they leave the churches of their parents they go out into the woods and thickets of New England and they go there in covered wagons and they spend like three four days crying and screaming and yelling and Talking praying and singing yeah, yeah and there are these like sweat soaked preachers screaming at them to repent and because travel is not easy, you know, in, in those – we're talking the end of the 19th century. Travel is not that, not that easy. So you usually bring a tent with you and you sleep in and hence the term tent revival. And uh. that's – it was that movement that gave birth to evangelical Christianity. And the, the sort of the primary drive of evangelical Christianity is twofold. Number one, individual salvation above all else. It's not about what church you belong to. You know, you're, you're Anglican – you're Presbyterian and you're Methodist and what? who cares? You know, it's it's about you and Jesus and that's all that matters. Yeah. And then the second thing is you have to go and convert the rest of the planet yeah. to evangelical Christianity. It's not enough to just kind of – Because I'm saved. Now I have a duty to save you. You have to save yeah. everyone. You have to go to every dark – an exotic corner of the world. You have to bring every soul to Christ. Mm. So this was a time in which these evangelical missionaries were just spreading in every corner of the globe, going places that no one had ever heard of before, places that no white person had ever been to yeah. before. Um, and Howard Baskerville is this sort of, you know, his dad is a country preacher. His grandfather's a country preacher. He goes to Princeton um, and he's there to study Christian theology. That's what he's there for. He's just going to become a country minister. That's, that's what his job is. And uh, Princeton has this new program that they started by uh, where you have to take electives, these things called electives that we now all, you know, take for granted. And so his junior year, he's like, fine, I'll take some electives. And he takes two electives with the newly elected president of Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson. Huh. And Wilson is a complicated dude. Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, he basically birthed what we now call international relations. Yeah. He helped win World War I against fascism. Yeah. You know, he created the League of Nations, which becomes the United Nations. He has this incredibly expansive idea that all peoples everywhere deserve to be free, that democracy is a gift given by God. It has nothing to do with America, that it is the, the, the sort of the will of God for all all human beings to be free, and it is the responsibility of Americans to go out there and make sure that everyone has what we this have. It's almost an evangelical form of democracy. It is. It was very religious for him. Yeah. I should mention it's hard to talk about Woodrow Wilson nowadays without also mentioning the fact that he was a fucking unrepentant racist. <laughs> I mean, like, his, his family owned slaves. He supported the Confederacy, like, decades after the Civil War. Like, decades <laughs> after the Civil War. Uh, you know? This dude contains the multitudes. Yeah. So, but nevertheless, and he lights this fire under Baskerville, and yeah. Baskerville's like, I'm not going to go back to Nebraska and be a country preacher. I'm going to go and convert the world, but I'm also going to, you know, give freedom to everyone. And he, it's, that, it's that American, uh, it's a deeply American thing. The deeply combination American. of evangelical Christianity with democracy, democracy. is gonna, a real yeah, strain. Yeah. I'm going to go and give it to the world. Yeah. And he begs the Presbyterian church to send him to China and Japan because like he, he's reading all these reports about how great it is there. Like, oh my gosh, in China, people are converting in mass and Japan is so beautiful and the weather's great. It looks like the UK. Uh, 
uh, but he gets sent to Persia and <laughs> it's the last place he wants to go. Like he's reading report, missionary report after missionary report from like missionaries who were spending decades in Persia saying, this is the worst place on earth. Yeah. These people are awful. And per- <laughs> Persia, this is the, this is the name for what we now call Iran. Was, well, yeah, 1935, it became known uh, officially as Iran. Um, and he arrives there and it's the opposite of everything he's been told. Huh. He falls in love with the culture and the people. He's teaching English and history in this sort of missionary school. He loves his students. His students love him. He literally falls in love with the headmaster's daughter. Wow. Um, he's having the time of his life at the same time <laughs> that there is this like revolution happening in front of him, you know, like on the streets where he lives. A revol- like he's literally living what he had spent a year studying, you know, yeah. with Woodrow Wilson. Um, and – but he's he's constantly told by the Presbyterian church, it's not your business. You're here to save souls, not lives. Mind your own damn business. Wow. He's constantly told by the American government. The uh, President Taft at that time uh, issued a, a, a memo basically about the, the Iranian revolution saying there's no such thing as Muslim democracy. That's stupid. Wow. And so there's no supporting – this revolution is Persia at this time majority Muslim. I assume, yeah, 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 but yeah, there yes. there are probably some amount of Christians there. But the revolution was Muslim in character, or no? The revolution was multi-religious. That's kind of the most exciting thing about it. And in fact, once Tabriz became the last bastion mm-hmm. of the revolution it became sort of this global cause where you had Mm. like Georgians and Russians and Armenians and Turks and Europeans and Arabs. Everyone started pouring into Tabriz because it was at that time the the most sort of successful anti-imperialist revolution. So it was Uh. this like multicultural, multilingual, multireligious revolution that Howard Baskerville just got absolutely swept up in. Wow. And – Event, it took a while. It took about a year and a half or so. But he, he eventually gives up his teaching position. He gives up his missionary post. Eventually gives up his American citizenship because he's he's threatened with treason. Wow. <laughs> uh, and he's like, well, okay, well, then I guess I'm not an American citizen anymore, so then I can't be treason. Um, wow. And, and he, in this incredible, like, oh, oh, made-for-movies moment— uh, tells his students, I can't be your teacher anymore. I can't continue to watch the suffering that I'm watching here. I, I need to do something about it. I'm going to go join the revolution. And his students get up and join with him. Wow. <laughs> it's like a, a demented, like a dead poet society, <laughs> you know, moment where they're like, no, all right, a, let's all go die. And it sounds <laughs> inspiring to me. It, it, uh, what's, de- what's demented about it? It, it actually it's not, it's not, Yeah, you're right. It's, it, it's, it, it, it was, it's, it's this kind of incredible moment. So he reconstitutes yeah. his classroom into a militia, um, despite the fact that he himself has no military yeah. training whatsoever. Uh, he actually had access to some Encyclopedia Britannica. And he basically <laughs> learns he learns like military maneuvers. And that's not a joke. He literally learns military maneuvers by reading the Encyclopedia Look, Britannica. Uh, okay, <laughs> under G four gun. How? Yeah. What do you do with it? What um, do you, which side do you point? <laughs> and he so he creates this militia. He and his students fight against the Shah along with the you know the rest of Tabriz. Um, and then the Shah changes tactics at one point and decides instead of trying to continue to defeat Tabriz because it's not working. Uh, I'm just going to besiege the city and starve you all to death. And what follows is four or five months of just horrific, horrific starvation and suffering in the city. I'm fast forwarding a lot through the story, obviously, but at the end, uh, on April 20th in 1909, Howard Baskerville and his students, his militia, decide – Enough's enough. We're going to try to break this siege. Wow. And so on the early morning of April 20th, 1909, they uh, – he and 11 of his students try to break through the, sh- the Shah's siege. Uh, I guess how many troops? Thousands. Wow. Thousands. Yeah. Um, and uh, he gets shot in the heart. Wow. And he dies. But that death becomes such an embarrassment uh, to the Shah, the Russians and the British empires who had been supporting the Shah the whole time, uh, ultimately force him to call for a ceasefire to let humanitarian assistance into Tabriz. And as soon as he does that, the revolutionaries break through the siege, 
march on Tehran, move the Shah from power, rewrite the constitution, reelect parliament. And the first act of parliament is to declare this 22-year-old Christian missionary to be a hero and a martyr of the revolution. His his tomb is still in Tabriz. There's like a, a museum there with his bust in it. Like when I was a kid wow, growing up in Iran, there were elementary schools named Howard Baskerville Elementary wow. School. I mean, this guy was such a hero, this, this like American Christian missionary, you know, who died yeah. for Iran. Um, but as you can imagine, you know, over the last 40 years, because of this animosity between America and the United yeah. States, his story has more or less been forgotten. Oh my yeah. God! What a fucking story! That's you, crazy. You have crazy. to you have to write this screenplay. This is incre- <laughs> yeah. this is unbelievable. Uh, like working on it. I, <laughs> I'm not going to try to write it. You have to. I mean, what an incredible like what an incredible conclusion to the story. So he's so he's shot in the heart, and then his case is what widely publicized enough that this missionary was killed in trying to what help the starving people. Yeah, that that he embarrasses people, yeah. it, it, it embarrasses the regime that much. Well, it's. it's at the moment, it was hugely embarrassing because all these reports of like the suffering that's happening in Tabriz and this attempt to break the siege and and then, of course, the death of this American missionary, all that stuff, you know, creates so much pressure. But what's really fascinating is almost immediately afterwards, thousands of people pour into Tabriz for his funeral. It's It's gigantic. Almost immediately – his story starts to be wiped. Not in Iran. In Iran, yeah. he's a hero. But in America, his story instantly. For, it's on the front pages of the New York Times. You know, American yeah. dies defending Tabriz is the, is the headline. But the problem is twofold. One, for the American government, they, they can't go around, you know, publicizing the story of, of American who's fighting in a— Foreign revolution, you know, like that's yeah. not a thing that people should be – you should know about. Yeah. So the U.S. government, the State Department especially tries very hard to sort of suppress this story and keep it quiet. But on the other side, the Presbyterian church, they're screwed. They can't <laughs> – they've got missionaries all over the world. they got missionaries in China. they got right. missionaries in Russia. they got missionaries all over Africa. They can't – let it be known that, oh, by the way, one of our missionaries might try to overthrow <laughs> your government. But, but don't worry about it. It's cool. It's cool. That's, that's the entire – I mean that's the, that's the entire stigma against missionaries. Well, there's a lot of stigmas it, against yeah. missionaries, rightly so. But like that that would be uh, any government's worry. And then if it happened one time – hold on a second. Yeah. Well, in fact, there's this hilarious thing that I, I read about in the book because it's these series of memos that go back and forth between the consul general in uh, Tabriz and the State Department – and the head of the Presbyterian foreign mission. The consul general basically writes the State Department and says, I did everything I could to stop Baskerville from fighting in this thing. I told him that he's going to get arrested for treason, and he gave me his passport. Like, uh-huh. what, what do I do? And the State Department says, well, we can't – we don't have any control over him. If he's giving up his citizenship, then he's not under American laws. We can't really do anything about it. Let's call the Presbyterian church. So they send a memo to the Presbyterian church saying, go get your boy. <laughs> like this, like go get Baskerville because he won't listen to us. Go get him. The Presbyterian Church freaks out for obvious reasons. Writes a memo to the State Department, and the memo. It, there's a lot of debate about this memo, but essentially what the memo says is, he's not our boy. Wow. Uh, he's not really a missionary. He's a teacher at a mission school. Uh, and the State yeah. Department, this I have the memo. just trying to disavow yeah, for the, political the purposes. Memo, yeah. The memo for the State Department back to, you know, the consul general in, in Tabriz because they're like, uh, they said he's not theirs. Uh, so basically says, we don't understand exactly the difference <laughs> between <laughs> somebody, a Here, teacher at a missionary here's school. Here's the problem. The, the Presbyterians are a wimpy denomination. Okay. The Catholics <laughs> would have gotten it done. Oh, the, the Methodists would have yeah. gotten it done. <laughs> No, but the Presbyterians, so, yeah. So this heroic kid, you know, who had a lot of flaws and a lot of ideas, but like he, he was somebody who was living out his values and who was willing to sacrifice himself for, you know, the freedom of other people. His entire story has been completely wiped from memory. 
uh, it's been wiped from memory in Iran. It was never even in our memory in in America. This is the first biography ever written about this kid. Wow, that's uh, unbelievable. But are there people keeping like the story alive in Iran? If, if it's clearly under the current regime, it wouldn't be a celebrated story. But is it like? I mean, you said you you there are elementary schools. Are there people who went to those elementary schools who are like, "Hey, kid, it's one a.m. Let me tell you about Howard Baskerville." You know? So it's funny because I I uh, I've got this uh, Iranian. Um, uh, production company that's doing this kind of really fun digital video for me, and they went to Tabriz uh, to film like at at the at the gravesite and in the museum and and to talk to people. And I knew that like no one under forty would have known who this kid was, but I was like, go find some old people, find some older people to and and ask them about it. And it was impossible. Like they yeah. would find occasionally they would find some old people who knew who he was but didn't want to talk about it, yeah. especially to on camera. Um, but they went into the museum. This is a museum dedicated to the to the Constitutional Revolution, a museum that's got a giant painting and a golden bust of Howard Baskerville. Wow. And they had the docent kind of walk them around the museum and they asked questions of the docent about Howard Baskerville and the docent barely knew who this guy was. Was wow. you know the guy paid <laughs> to like tell you about uh, you know these characters yeah. didn't know him. Uh, someone built this museum a while ago. Yeah. I don't know why it's here. <laughs> I'm just paid to walk around. No one yeah. comes in know. here ever. But if you talk to older people, mm. you know, like my parents' generation, they still speak about Howard Baskerville with this like reverence that they reserve for saints. Wow, you know, um, I- Iran. At the heart of Iranian culture is this concept of martyrdom and sacrifice, mm-hmm. right? And, and it's been, you know, bastardized and, and people, you know, th- have, have used that idea to, to say a lot of shit about Iran or whatever. But fundamentally, Iranians believe that values and beliefs are shit until they are put into practice. Like, if you are not willing to die for something that you believe in, then you don't believe it. Yeah. And it's actually a big reason why evangelical missionary work in Iran had been so unsuccessful. Baskerville preached the gospel for a year and a half. I've scoured the historical <laughs> records. I don't think he converted a single person, yeah. not one person, yeah. because Iranians don't give a shit about what you have to say. Mm. Are you willing to die for it? Yeah. And the fact that this kid, was able to say, in the name of my American identity, in the name of my Christianity, I am going to pick up a weapon and I'm going to save as many people as I can from certain death and die doing it. That's what made him a hero. That's what made him a martyr. That's what put him in until 79 into Iranian history books, you know. There are still now, I have some friends in Iran who tell me there's still like, you know, a couple of hip coffee shops in Tehran called Baskerville. <laughs> but that's it. That's about it. Uh, no, no, no kidding. It's like Baskerville lattes. I'm not joking. I'm not kidding, man. Man, uh, don't name a coffee shop fucking anything. <laughs> yeah, no matter exactly. how disrespectful yeah. it is. That is such an incredible story. And I want to ask you what bearing this has on Iran today. But we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Reza Austin. Hey, everybody. If you're enjoying this conversation, I hope you will consider supporting the show on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. And for just five bucks a month, you can get every episode of Factually ad-free. You get bonus podcast episodes and you can join our community Discord group and chat with like-minded, curious people about the show or about anything else under the sun. We even have a live community book club where we read a recent nonfiction book together and discuss it sometimes with the author. It's a ton of fun and I hope you will consider joining our community. Just head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. That's patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Reza, this story is incredible of Howard Baskerville. Uh, how, I mean, again, our our understanding of Iran as a country in the United States is so narrow. It's based on, you know, once every, you know, three years, there'll be one scary story about Iran on CNN, right? And that's, <laughs> right. that's all that people get. What bearing do you think this story has on, you know, how we could understand Iran differently today? You know, it's, you know, it's funny, despite four decades of animosity between the Iranian government and the American government, I think people would be shocked at how 
unbelievably pro-American the Iranian population is. We talked about mm. this earlier. This is 75% of the population of Iran is under the age of 30. They are wow. uh, globally connected. They, they know what you know. They read what you read. They have access to what you have access to. They know what the world is like. And they absolutely loathe their government. It's kind of like the flip side of like the 60s and 70s where they hated their government. And so because America supported the government and, the, and their government loved America, they hated America. Now they hate their government, but the government hates America. So they love America. They love American food and American clothes and American music and American culture. When 9-11 happened, Thousands, thousands of Iranians poured out onto the streets to mourn with America. It was the only population in the entirety of the Middle East um, in which you saw that kind of spontaneous emotional response for the United States. And the truth of the matter is, is that Iranians and Americans have so much in common yeah. with each other. Um, even this whole thing, you know, people are like, oh, Iranians are so religious. First of all, no, they are not. They are not. Like when when religion is forced upon them by the government, uh -huh. uh, you know, it's it's very hard, honestly, to find certainly any young Iranian that is like overtly religious, wow. you know, by choice. Um, but at the same time, Iran's conception of religion is very much aligned with kind of America's conception of religion. You know, the, the stuff that Woodrow Wilson said about, you know— uh, God and government. I mean, any any Iranian would agree with that. And so what I'm really hoping is that if I could just revive the memory of this kid, Howard Baskerville, in both countries. I am doing yeah. a, a free Persian version of this book that's a PDF that anyone can download in Persian in Iran. So Amazing. it goes bypasses all the censors and stuff. But if I can revive the memory of this kid in both America and Iran— then maybe in a way that he could form a, a bridge of understanding, you know, yeah. he, he could remind us at the very least of everything that we have in common with each other. You know, these two countries that, that whose governments loathe each other for, for very, you know, reasonable reasons. I get yeah. it. We have different foreign policy perspectives and interests and all that stuff, but whose populations have so much in common well, because this kid had this kid had the reaction to the revolution that I was naively suggesting the American government should have, which was, oh, I I I grew up learning about the American Revolution, about democracy. Here it is happening in front of my eyes. I should help because <laughs> right. I that's what is that's American values, right? I mean, it was that part that was of his why he, yeah. that was his argument. You know, he, there's a lot of there's a he got a lot of shit for being willing to give up his American citizenship. And in fact, there's a lot of confusion in the sources about he was willing to hand his passport over. And the question is, did he ha hand it over mm. or did they take it? Did he actually do it? Was he willing to do it, but he didn't? Whatever. The point is, is that there's a, he got a lot of shit for this idea that, oh, he abandoned his Americanness or that he abandoned his Christianity. But I have the letters that yeah. he wrote. The letters he wrote to his mom, the letters that he – on the eve of his death, the letters that he wow. wrote to the, the consul general saying, hey, there's a lot of confusion about why I'm doing what I'm doing, but I just want to make it as clear as possible. I'm not doing this because I've abandoned Christ. This is what Christ would do. Wow. I'm not doing this because I've abandoned America. This is what Americans should do. I'm doing this in the name of all those things that you are saying that I am abandoning. And if anything, it's you guys who are abandoning yeah. these values. And that's what know. makes it an inspiring story because he is living out the values, the positive values of his faith and of his country in a way that his the religious institution and in a way that America itself has not. That is exactly what I was bemoaning America yeah. not doing. Why the hell aren't we, you know, supporting a, a legitimate democratic revolution? Why are we supporting the the autocrats instead? Why do we do that around the world? Yeah. But individually, those values are still real. They're just expressed by individual Americans rather than by our government and many times. And especially nowadays where – you know, far from like supporting democracy in the rest of the world, we're not even all that fond of democracy here. We're like, eh, you know, eh, freedom. Well, not when it disagrees you know, with me. Yeah. Elections, you know, not that, you know. Uh, or 
where you have, you know, I mean, for better or worse, American Christians have now gotten this label, right? Where it's like they they we call them Christo fascists or Christian mm-hmm. nationalism, where they are trying to codify laws you know, on the rest of Americans based on their sort of limited conception of Christian yeah. morality. And here is this kid who's like, uh, you know, what, if you really want to call yourself a Christian, that means you do what Christ did. And what did Christ do? He sacrificed himself, mm-hmm. himself for other people to save other people. That's what he did. He didn't, you know— work to change Roman law to outlaw abortion. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was like, you know, he wasn't like at the legislature, you yeah. know, in Rome. Or ban like, Judaism or anything yes, else. Yeah. Exactly. Um, he actually lived that out. And, you know, he didn't talk, he didn't talk about how great democracy is and, you know, how wonderful it would be if the rest of the world was, you know, democratic. He saw people fighting for their most Basic rights, yeah. the right to have a say in the decisions that rule your life. That's not that big of a deal. That's a very small thing to ask for. And he thought he couldn't believe that America wasn't supporting this. And so he just did it himself. He was literally, I told you, there were hundreds of revolutionaries that came from all over the world to join this revolution. There was one American, one American, wow. and he was a 20-something Christian missionary with no military <laughs> training whatsoever. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Uh, I have to ask, and it's maybe a big question to ask as we're getting towards the end of the podcast, but you know, when you say that we have so much in common with uh, uh, Americans and Iranians and that they hate their government, then how does the regime persist, right? Uh, especially in a country that has a history of revolutions, of yeah, everyone yeah. in the country saying, you know what, we're fed up about this. Let's go get into the streets and, and tear it down. But yet this regime, which is not supported by the majority of Iranians in in your account has persisted for what, 40 years now? This is such a great question and it's such an important answer and I want to answer it fully so I'm going to speak as fast as I possibly can. (laughs) Here it goes. Number one, Almost on a daily basis, there are protests and uprisings and and uh, strikes and everything else that you can imagine happening in Iran all the time right now. It's happening every day. It's not getting enough attention. Wow. This government is barely, barely holding on. But they have a huge advantage, and it's a very easy thing to understand. A tyrant stays in power by isolating his people from the rest of the world. If you have to rely on that tyrant literally for bread, Mm -hmm. literally to keep the lights on, right, then you're far less likely to to successfully be able to bring that tyrant down. For 40 years, America has had this wrongheaded, dim-witted policy that if we can just sanction, isolate, and, uh. and you know, contain Iran from the rest of the world, if we can destroy its economy, if we can, you know, isolate it from the rest of the world, if we can cut it off from the free market, right. if we can cut it off from, from the globe when it comes to medical supplies or, you know, the international banking system, then eventually the people will rise up and bring down their government. But that doesn't work. It's Mm. the exact opposite that happens. A country that's isolated, contained, and sanctioned can barely pay for, uh, you know, food for the day. The idea that this is a population that would go out and risk its lives bringing the government down is very hard to imagine when you can't keep the lights on in your house. And and again, despite all that, we're still seeing it. We're still seeing people on the streets, thousands of people on the streets protesting this government. But once again, it is truly... American action, American foreign policy that has kept this regime in power for four plus decades, whereas the opposite is what you want to do. If you want a successful, quote unquote, you know, democratic society, you need two things. You need a vibrant middle class right? Uh, a middle class that has what we, we used to call it the leisure class. The, the, mm-hmm. the, the ability, the freedom to actually even think about, hey, 
Right. We should change. Gonna, we should change things. I'm going to read a newspaper. I've right. got a couple free hours to vote. Yes. Let me go to the coffee shop and talk right. about politics. All Instead those of I've of got things. three yeah. jobs, yeah. you know, just to keep the, the lights on. Yeah. And you need access to the free market economy. You mm. need access to the rest of the world. We have cut off both of those things mm -hmm. from Iran on purpose because we think that it will eventually convince the Iranian people to get rid of their government. The Iranian people hate their government. They would like nothing more than to get rid of their government. Yeah. They don't have the ab ability to do so because – of a four-decade sanctions regime. And I love this idea. There's a lot of people who would disagree with what I'm saying. That's fine. There's, there's a lot of sort of really brilliant government minds out there who can, who can draw analogies around like, well, there are certain ways in which you could use a sanction regime in order to create positive change within a government. Okay, fantastic. Great. Go, go and do that. But here's what is undeniable. 40 fucking years yeah. of doing the exact same thing has done nothing to bring down this government. If anything, it is just entrenched them yeah. in place. So maybe, just maybe, <laughs> we try something else? Yeah. Yeah. Try some blue jeans and rock and roll and, you know, bring some <laughs> bring some food in and and let them connect with the with the rest of the of the world, which is something yeah. they're hungry to do. It's 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 ridiculous. And 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 I'm not, you know, I know I'm being very general here because, you know, we only have a few minutes, but there are so many easy things to do. Yeah. So the United States has singularly because it has uh, a veto power, kept Iran from joining the World Trade Organization, the WTO, which has uh. been trying for a long time. And the uh, Iran, uh, America's government is, it's a terrible government. They do terrible things. They should be punished, not rewarded by joining the WTO, despite the fact that Iran is desperate to join the WTO. Okay. When a country joins the WTO, the World Trade Organization, in order to stay in the World Trade Organization, they have to enact certain economic and political right. changes. And it meshes them in the global right. system. It forces them to do precisely the kind of progressive and liberal uh, actions that they need so that they could stay in the WTO. And then if they fuck up, they can be punished by being removed from the WTO. America has this idea that you can punish Iran by taking away something that they already don't have. Uh huh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And if we just keep doing that for maybe four more decades, yeah. then maybe something will change. Well, and the big, uh, I think, especially leftist critique of the WTO is that it like erodes sovereignty for nations, right? It makes nations have to do no what question. the WTO wants, <laughs> right. which if you are not a leftist, if you're the American government, you want to topple the Iranian government, well, then maybe membership in the WTO is what you should allow to have happen. So basic and obvious. <laughs> so basic. And here we're having this conversation again with the nuclear accords and all that stuff, you know, the JCPOA, um, which, you know, Obama got all this shit for, for, you know, signing those accords, which again, right. forced Iran to join an economic partnership with all of Europe and Russia and China, which then gives them something that we could take away if we want to punish them. Right. See, you can't punish a country when you don't give them anything to begin with. What right. are we going to sanction you more? What are we going to do? Yeah. There's nothing we can do to punish Iran. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so I think it's just this – again, it goes back to this is policy that is being dictated by emotion. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds weird because, like, governments aren't supposed to think this way. But this was a very, very nasty divorce uh -huh. and the bitterness. <laughs> so maybe just having – maybe just getting to a point where you can have a phone call every once in a while and say, hey, yeah. tell you what, we can we can nod and shake hands when we hand over the kids on weekends right. or something. That, exactly. would be, that would be an improvement. It's, a, it's an early start. And maybe this book will be that first, you know – Phone call. I mean, it's, not, it's ridiculous to say, OK, well, maybe a book can change policy. But, you know, we need a different story. Yeah. You know, stories are how we understand the world. It's how we understand ourselves. It's how we understand our role in the universe. And right now, the story about Iran and the United States is stuck in this hostage crisis revolution, Iran Contra, mm -hmm. you know, terrorism, you know, Iran Iraq war, like that that whole thing that we've been talking about. And what we need is a different story. Yeah. And it might sound naive 
and a little pie in the sky, but I think I think basketball can be that story. I hope so. I mean, I really thank you for coming on to share the story with us today. It's an incredible story. Uh, tell us again the full name of the book and when does it come out? An American Martyr in Persia. And then the subtitle is The Epic Life and tragic death of Howard Baskerville. Um, and the book comes out October 11th, and it's available everywhere now. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for this, Adam. Thank you so much for having me. Reza, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Appreciate it's it. been incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you once again to Reza for coming on the show. If you want to pick up a copy of his book, head to factuallypod.com slash books. That's factuallypod.com slash books. I want to thank everybody who supports our show on Patreon at the $15 a month level. That's Adrian, Alexi Batalov, Allison Liparado, Alan Liska, Ann Slagle, Antonio LB, Aurelio Jimenez, Beth Brevik, Camus and Lego, Charles Anderson, Chase Thompson Bow, Chris Stale, Courtney Henderson, David Condry, David Conover, Drill Bill, Dude with Games, Eben Lowe, Ethan Jennings, Hillary Wolken, Jim Myers, Jim Shelton, Julia Russell, Kelly Casey, Kelly Lucas, uh, Lacey Tiganoff, Lisa Matulis, Mark Long, Miles Gillingsrud, Mom Named Gwen, Mrs. King Coke, Nicholas Morris, Nikki Batelli, Nuya Gick, Ippaluk, Paul Mauk, Paul Schmidt, Rachel Nieto, Richard Watkins, Robin Madison, Ryan Shelby, Samantha Schultz, Sam Ogden, Scooper, Spencer Campbell, Susan E. Fisher, and Whiskey Nerd 88. If you want to join them, head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. I want to thank our producer, Sam I'm Roudman, our engineer Kyle McGraw, our video editor Noah Diamond, the fine folks at Falcon Northwest for building me this incredible custom gaming PC that I'm recording this very episode for you on. You can find me online at Adam Conover and you can find my tour dates and everything else that I'm doing at adamconover.net. Thank you so much for listening and we will see you next week on Factually. A, pod <clears throat> a podcast network.